Okay. Do you guys hear me? And I see you can see my slides. That is wonderful. The only thing I'm missing is is water, but okay. I guess we'll have to do without that. So uh, we'll talk about my school sharding today. So anybody knows uh, who what sharding is here? Okay, some of you do, right? Anybody thinks uh, sharding is painful? Oh, okay. Uh, that's good. So uh, first, let me mention a few words about uh, uh, Percona and why really we are speaking about that. So we, uh, as a company, focus on uh, really helping our uh, customers to succeed with uh, MySQL and more recently uh, in ADB. We provide a whole bunch of services running from uh, support to managed services, uh, and we write a lot of software for for MySQL. Colin has mentioned some, right? We we have Percona Server, Percona XRB cluster, as well as uh, tools for backups, Percona XRB backup, and uh, uh, Percona Toolkit. There are, I think, two things which are important about us. One is all our software is uh, open source. We are not uh, having some uh, enterprise uh, version which is closed source, so there is some other way to require you to pay if you want to use that. And we are also really uh, vendor neutral. That is not our goal to really make you uh, to use uh, Percona software. That is our goal to, uh, as a company to really provide you the best solution for yourself. And frankly, that's maybe MySQL, that's maybe the Percona server, that's maybe uh, MariaDB or uh, Amazon RDS. Uh, if you're happy, if you're happy. So let me start with a story when I talk about charging. A uh, couple of years back, uh, a customer comes to me and says, oh my gosh, you know, I read this all wonderful stories about Facebook, uh, they're sharding, and there is a Dropbox sharding, and there is uh, everybody in the world is sharding. So uh, can you guys please advise me how to shard? And I say, hmm, okay, let's look at your system first. Uh, and I would ask you, what exactly is your database size, right? Probably it's like, well, uh, it's about uh, two gigs in total. Hmm, uh, interesting, right? Do you guys have a lot of traffic? Oh, actually, no, it's about 100 queries a second. Wow, maybe you just guys uh, just launched and you're planning to grow uh, approximately 1,000 times in the next three months. Well, no, actually, we've been in business for about five years. We're growing about 7% a year, and we're expecting that for the next year, right? Well, uh, no, wonderful story, right? Uh, and, well, the case uh, in this case is Obviously, with such a small system, oh, thank you, uh, you don't really need to shard, right? Because even if the uh, Moore's law is kind of, uh, uh, you know, g kind of getting dead, right? They're still expecting performance improvements in the system much more than uh, 7% a year, right? So uh, the outcome for that is before you really decide how you're going to shard, you guys really need to decide, decide wherever you need to shard at all, right? And I think that is a very important question because if you guys go to different conference, law, uh, uh, read a lot of famous bloggers, a lot of them work for really large and famous companies, and they are often going to talk about how to, MySQL, to operate MySQL on extreme scale. That may not be uh, exactly your case, and in your case, the different principles may uh, may apply. Now what is interesting is with modern technology you can really go quite far uh, without charging, right? And I, uh, and I think with our uh, semi-obsession with dis distributed systems in the recent years, we may forget how much you can actually get from a single simple uh, MySQL box, right? And let me uh, throw out some numbers. From a single MySQL server, you can get more than uh, 100K queries a second. You can get more than 100K rows updated or inserted deleted per second. If you are going to some data kind of scanning queries, you can get probably more than 5 uh, uh, million rows uh, uh, in memory. MySQL can deal with uh, 10K of concurrent connections, and, uh, and if you are having uh, some uh, good box with a good storage and networking, you can actually have a, a 10 terabytes or so uh, on the single MySQL instance, right? And this is not the marketing data, and it's not extreme, right? 
So if you uh, uh, the storage, that's one of the things which I hear a lot of people tell me, really? Do you really have anybody on the planet having 10 terabytes on the single MySQL instance? And I'll tell you, yes, I've seen many people doing that, and I have seen people uh, up to about 50 terabytes on the single MySQL instance, right? That is kind of extreme, and I wouldn't quite uh, go that way, but, uh, but I think that gives you a good perspective. Now, guys, these are not some extreme marketing numbers, right? These are something what you can get from a pretty mid-range system, even in the cloud, right? Uh, and for a change, I'll show you some marketing numbers, right? So I uh, stole that from Oracle. Uh, where is Dave here, right? Dave, oh, he, he ran away. Anyway, so uh, I hope nobody is watching. But anyway, uh, this is the uh, marketing slide, uh, uh, which is uh, actually also true, right? Uh, but it is on a larger box with relatively simple query. But you can see we are getting uh, well over half a million um, uh, queries with MySQL. Uh, uh, five sem on the high end, right? So, hundred thousand queries is quite conservative. Now let's do some math, right? Let's say we have certain system and uh, we are planning for maybe three million uh, active users, and those users have thirty interactions per day. And with all our kind of fault becoming kind of adjunctive uh, and interactive, probably for single uh, interaction you're going to have unlikely more than ten queries, right? So with all this math and uh, ac accounting for peak, for free X between your night hours and kind of peak hours, right? Uh, we came to, oh shit. Uh, I was talking about the wrong slide, okay. Anyway, th that's the math I was talking about. Can you actually sh say shit on camera here? Uh, I, uh, oh, I did twice, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, anyway. So if you do this over math, right, what do we come out to? to? It is uh, about 30,000 of queries a second, right? So really, it is not a lot, even with those quite large uh, uh, numbers of users, interactions, and so on and so forth, right? So if you look at examples, well, the companies we worked with, which avoided charging, that's quite, quite, quite range a lot, right? We had worked with a pretty large uh, enterprise household name here in the U.S., but the more household name it is, the more they don't like you talking about them and naming them, right? Uh, uh, I don't know why. But anyway, so those guys are using Drupal for uh, everyday workflow for everybody of 200,000 uh, uh, employees, right? Can Use Drupal, no sharding required. MySQL server loaded about, I think, 3% in, in, in average. Of course, they would use some uh, replicas, right, for high ability purposes. But from performance alone, you, you don't need that. We also work with a number of e-commerce merchants, right, and some of them are selling well over uh, the $10 million, million of dollars per month. Right? So there's a very pretty serious uh, e-commerce businesses don't need any kind of sharding. So, as you guys already told me at the start of this talk, is that sharding is a pain, right? Yes, well, and I know some of us like pain. Uh, well, or maybe many of us like pain. I'm not quite sure what kind of uh, this audience is, but, well, pain is not always good, right? Let's uh, uh, all agree on that. When it becomes too much pain, we still Stop liking it, right? So, in a lot of cases, uh, even if we sharding uh, uh, is pain, and in a lot of cases we want to either delay it or mm, avoid it, right? So, what kind of pains do sharding bring to us? Well, a lot of that has to do with uh, uh, with complexity. Complexity for developers, right? Now I have to uh, instead of querying one system, I have to figure out where my uh, data is, and again, even if uh, even if it's uh, sharding done automatically for you, if you're a good developer, you still have to fr uh, think about that because your perform uh, query performance profile is going to uh, uh, the, is going to really uh, depend on the data distribution. There is more complexity from operational standpoint. 
there is more kind of techno complexity in technology because you have more bits and pieces. You have to deal with much more complicated failure scenarios compared to just single boxes essentially which works or doesn't. Uh, and much more complicated performance profile with bottleneck the network involved uh, uh, in much more sense and so on and so forth. Now MySQL sharding is frankly especially painful because uh, compared to many other systems like uh, MongoDB being a good example, MySQL uh, sharding is still have to is very manual, right? MySQL came from an era when uh, this kind of many servers operating together as a single entity uh, wasn't really a thought, right? And it, it was after thought, it was bolted in, bolted on, right? And in many cases, it was bolted on um, uh, by, by the users, right? Let's say Facebook would uh, bolt on their own sharding, right, of the tests, which you mentioned, uh, YouTube, their own, right? Their, uh, Guys like Oracle or uh, MariaDB uh, working on MySQL Fabric, MySQL Router, Max Scale, all those things have came much, much later, right? So if you can't uh, avoid the sharding, you can uh, often delay it, right? And why can't you avoid the sharding? Well, frankly, even though the modern systems became much, much more powerful and can handle a lot of beating for, uh, for, for a single no, uh, node, uh, you can't build a Facebook on a single node, right? Or even a system which is probably 1% uh, of a Facebook size. So, uh, but in those cases, uh, such systems are typically not born overnight, right? And it can take quite a while uh, to get there, right? And uh, uh, you may uh, not need to shard and waste a lot of your development and operational resources on uh, dealing with that issues until you have much larger resources and much larger development and operational teams. So what few uh, strategies do we have for avoiding the sharding, right, or delaying the sharding? And they go across those several dimensions, which is uh, using architecture, functional partitioning, replication, caching, queuing, and using some what I will call uh, supplemental technologies, right? Let's go through them uh, one after another. So when you look uh, at the architecture, uh, we'll talk about a lot of architecture questions uh, in other top uh, areas as well. But uh, what I think is a, uh, one of the changes uh, in the architecture recently was how people start to evolve to either uh, microservices, each of owning kind of their own data, right, and maybe actually using different uh, data store technologies, right, uh, uh, on the back. Uh, or uh, some people would call that not quite microservices, but service oriented architecture. But in, in, may, in any cases, you essentially do have uh, certain number of block rather than one monolith system, right, which have uh, different data stores, right, so the load and amount of data each of them have to store uh, is, is different, right. So for example, you can say, hey, this is my interface which provide, let's say, user profile services, right, and this is maybe my, my billing system. If they live in, uh, uh, in a different if they design as different services, they probably don't have to uh, uh, don't have to live in the same database. Now, this also uh, can be seen through an other lens, which I call functional partitioning, right? And what that necessarily means is what we want to keep our separate data mm, uh, data separate, right? Think about uh, I don't know even such a basic side uh, as a percona. Right? We have a lot of different uh, bits and pieces out there, right? We have uh, our blog, uh, we have our uh, Drupal-based website, we have, uh, you know, some uh, other, uh, other components. Really, each of them are quite independent, right? And they uh, live uh, on, the, uh, on the separate databases to start with. I think it's important in this case to really uh, maintain them to be uh, independent and not accidentally mixing when you don't uh, uh, don't do that, because 
then uh, if you need to scale and separate them on, on the different systems later on, that's maybe hard. To give you uh, uh, one of the simple practical advices is if you have systems which have to, which operate in the outside on the different databases, give them different MySQL users with different permissions, which only have access to, to the databases they, uh, they are designed to access for, uh, have access for, right? So that means, for example, if your main website needs an access to the content in Drupal, that wouldn't happen by the accident. And then you say, oh, let me just move those to, uh, let's say, blog and, and Drupal website on different systems. You have uh, things broken down because there are some joins or anything else you didn't uh, uh, expect. Okay. Uh, replication, right? So anybody here use MySQL replication? Yes, well, I think the MySQL replication is probably by far the most popular strategy, both for MySQL high availability as well as for MySQL scaling, right? Uh, what replication allows us is to mainly scale reads. But what is a good thing is in the web applications, reads are typically a very large portion of a, of a workload, right? Majority of them for many applications. What you need to uh, be aware about MySQL replication. What MySQL replication, built-in replication that is, is asynchronous, right? And don't let words trick you. Semi-synchronous replication is also asynchronous, right? So, so semi-synchronous is not synchronous, that is actually uh, asynchronous with some better recovery properties. Uh, if you're looking for other MySQL replication options, I would uh, uh, consider Perconex Ruby cluster or other uh, Galera-based solution. If you are the uh, Amazon Cloud fan, the Amazon Aurora also does its own unique uh, uh, replication approach uh, to MySQL. The next uh, trick, which uh, is very powerful, uh, is using some sort of caching with MySQL, which also allows us to, uh, to scale reads. Right, so uh, anybody uh, used uh, things like memcache here? or Redis maybe for caching, right? Or if you guys uh, uh, have your application written in Java, you may actually uh, cache it just in the application level, right? Not to go to a database uh, all the time. Caching is really, really powerful, right? And uh, I've seen applications which through use of a caching alone would able to reduce uh, the traffic to MySQL by uh, more than 95%, right? So that can be... Uh, uh, that's kind of pretty cool. So MySQL have uh, uh, also built in uh, cache, uh, query cache. But uh, the thing what we know about the query cache in MySQL is what it sucks. I mean, it was designed in uh, MySQL 4.0, right? It did not uh, get any attention uh, until now. It doesn't scale uh, very well, both with many CPU cores as well as the large cache sizes, right? So if you have some like really, really bad applications, some really, really bad queries and low concurrency, you actually may benefit from MySQL query cache. But uh, most high-end installations have to dis disable that. The interesting thing about the query cache show, uh, that is one of the things where Amazon Aurora uh, seems to have uh, uh, Im implemented a number of changes. Amazon Aurora query cache is much, much better than MySQL query cache. And frankly, I believe a lot of the benchmarks published, that is uh, really the cause, right? Just much better query cache. I mean, uh, maybe this kind of a competition between the giant or giants of Amazon and Oracle will um, make Oracle also interested to make some better query cache-like solution for, for MySQL too. Well, we spoke about application server cache, mem cache, uh, and Redis. Two other things I think are quite important to know. One is you often can cache MySQL and MySQL itself. Building the summary tables for uh, some very heavy queries instead of running them all the time, right? You can call it like materialized views if you like, which are like glorified summary tables, uh, can be very, very powerful optimization techniques. Another thing which uh, I know a lot of uh, DBAs uh, or database developers don't think about is uh, things as HTTP cache, right? In a lot of cases, 
caching on HTTP level is absolutely the most powerful, right? Because frankly, the best way for your, to give your customer the best performance ever is if he doesn't even have to go from his you know, system, right, to rec request to refresh an object. If it's cached right there in, in the browser memory, right, uh, over disk space. And you can often uh, achieve that for, uh, for a lot of data by implementing proper HTTP caching policies, right? So uh, uh, read on that. Queuing. That is uh, another kind of big uh, secret. If you look at that, uh, any large scale system uh, out there does use some queuing, as, at least for some of the things, right? Uh, because of, of many things, right? Uh, queuing helps us to scale rights for a variety of reasons, right? But it also allows us often to balance the, uh, balance the spikes, right? Uh, if think about that. If, uh, if I go ahead and something fun happens and I upload the spike of, uh, you know, maybe 10x more YouTube videos, right, which needs to be transcoded than average, well, it would be overload the system trying to transcode them all at the same time in real time, right? By just putting them in the queue and then getting to them, then you can get with your resources, right? Maybe doing some dynamic scalability on the background. That is much, much better uh, architecture. And that also applies to a lot of the database uh, things, right? Let's say if you building something like, uh, like Twitter and you have a lot of followers to deal with, it's much better idea not to try to put all of those notifications in real time, but put that to a queue, right, and then uh, uh, do whatever you have to do in the background. So uh, there are a number of systems which we use for queuing. It's Rabbit, uh, RabbitMQ, ActiveMQ, Redis is very popular, and what we see a lot, uh, getting a lot of traction uh, uh, the, uh, those days, uh, especially uh, uh, for certain use cases is uh, is Kafka. Anybody used Kafka here? Okay, well, mm, great to see a fair amount of hands. Now, the other uh, thing that I mentioned is uh, use different technologies, right? Well, uh, I hope that's not a secret for you, but the MySQL is not a silver bullet, right? Nothing else. And uh, as, the, as much as it's great for certain things, it absolutely sucks for a lot of other things, right? Uh, and frankly, it's uh, uh, very interesting for me being involved in MySQL ecosystem for so many years to look back and say, well, let's say eight years ago, we would do something like we'll try to write a parallel scripts which will go through, let's say, 10 slaves or 100 slaves, right? Run some queries in parallel and then aggregate those results of a group bias and all the other crazy stuff, right? And then what happened? Well. Actually, we decided what well, those things are much better done on Hadoop and Spark, uh, or Spark, right? When you need to crunch through a lot of data in parallel. Just don't do MySQL for that, right? I mean, uh, it will be just pain and probably little gain. There are also uh, technologies for full text search. MySQL 5.6, uh, 5.7 have a full text search. Thankfully, it works with InnoDB now, right? So we don't have to peak between transactions or full text search abilities. But it's not really a scalable solution, right? It's uh, what you can call like a, uh, a low duty, right? If you're implementing search for home DVD collection, right, or something like that, if it's not overly large, you can use MySQL full text search, right? If you are building the search for many uh, hundreds of gigabytes or terabytes of data, you will be much happier using Elasticsearch, Sphinx, Solar, right, or some other. Uh, custom-made full-text search technologies which do that in parallel. And you will be also able to have much more flexible search and much better uh, search quality. There is also a selection of document stores you can use. There is also uh, Cassandra, which we saw for some very simple but very, uh, data store, but very scalable and uh, uh, reliable one. Uh, it has been uh, amazing. The next thing to consider is what you actually want to consider optimizing your system before sharding, right? 
Uh, I don't know, I see a lot of people who are being kind of lazy or they just like those kind of to go to a boss, ask for a lot of hardware and then kind of play with distributed systems and uh, kind of uh, uh, instead of just going and freaking tuning the indexes, right? I don't know why. No, but that is what we see uh, uh, the, time, mm, the time and again. So what you can do and you should do in terms of optimization? Hardware. You know, think about getting fast, uh, 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 fast CPUs, right? Especially because MySQL executes single query in one core. Don't uh, b uh, buy into advertisement. Oh, we'll give you CPU with 14 cores, but they all will be, you know, less than two gigahertz, right, or something like that. For MySQL, that doesn't work well, right? MySQL likes faster, uh, faster cores, and for modern CPUs, you essentially want to look at a turbo boost frequency, right? Not the nominal one, because that is what's going, what your CPU is going to run at when you're just running one very, very heavy query, right? You want plenty of memory, because accessing the data in memory is much, much faster than going to disk. And guys, uh, Please understand, that happens even if you're using very fast fast storage. The fastest Fusion I.O., right, or some NVMe storage is still going to be orders of magnitude slower than just going to the memory to fetch that, you know, 10 bytes you need from a field in the, in the row. Flash, uh, fast flash storage, right, so solid state drives. I mean, for operational databases, you should not be running anything else, frankly. Anybody else is here suffering with spinning disks? Uh, why? What? Oh, ah, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, well, so, I mean, I, I know in some cases we have some, uh, uh, some issues, right, um, uh, with, uh, I, I don't know, it may be politics, it may be uh, what somebody doesn't believe what SSDs can be re reliable, you know, 10 years later, right? Uh, it, it could be what they just uh, sp sp spent all their storage budget for the next 10 years buying EMC for $10 million five years ago, right? Or some stuff like that. Well, but anyway, if you're being practical, you know, you want flash storage. And you also want to have a, a good network, of course, right? A lot of the modern application that comes to MySQL can be dominated by network through latency, right? Because uh, I, um, uh, I recently looked at, uh, let's say, how much, uh, if you look at the gigabit network, right, for example, often you will have uh, what, what's going to be round trip, right, in terms of in, in the data center. I think it's, uh, it's probably about uh, f uh, 300 uh, microseconds. Now, if you look at the MySQL, uh, it can really process the simple queries typically in, uh, in less than 40 microseconds, right? So if you think about that, simple selects or, or something, latency is going to be dominated by the network latency, at least at uh, uh, one gigabit networks, right? Another important thing about the networks is to think about the distance and number of hops. I have seen so many uh, people making a mistake of placing MySQL server and app server very far, right, from, uh, uh, from each other, either distance-wise or just having very, a lot of a network e equipment in between, which can uh, add up a lot of latency, right? If you go through a few routers and so on and so forth, it's all adds up. Environment. Well, I probably would be preaching to acquire in this case, but I, I think that good is, uh, Linux is pretty good operation system to run MySQL, right? Would you agree with me, guys? Yeah. Right? Yeah, so, uh, and, and thank, uh, and actually that is also the more popular ones, right? I think a lot of uh, large-scale deployments are done on Linux these days, right? I see, uh, I think, a little bit more, actually, FreeBSD deployments, right, we start. Uh, popping up over the last uh, uh, couple of years, but uh, Linux is still absolutely uh, uh, dominating. New MySQL versions generally scale better, not uh, not surprised, but scale better at, at this, uh, with multiple connections, with many CPUs, 
with more complicated queries because of Mary Optimizer. But for simple queries for a single thread, MySQL has actually become slower and slower over the last releases, right? Last benchmarks I've seen, MySQL 5.7 is somewhere like 15% uh, slower than MySQL 5.0 running single thread benchmark like SQL Bench. Right? Uh, you can uh, look up Mark Callaghan has uh, wrote about that. MySQL 5.7, uh, uh, you guys heard about that. That's a pretty uh, interesting uh, GA release. I see there is a lot of still things kind of uh, uh, in flux. There are some changes implemented, right? So uh, uh, maybe I would not just rush an upgrade to 5.7 today, but uh, wait there. Uh, dust settle, but if you guys are starting with new development and plan to go in production in a few months, 5.7 is a great choice. And uh, we are also working on the Percona server, 5.7, which should be out uh, uh, sometime in, in February, and we have a release candidate available already, so you guys can check it out, give us some feedback. Configuration, right? Some people may disagree, but uh, MySQL default configuration sucks. And it is by design, right? Because really MySQL uh, was designed something like you install a new server, it sits out there uh, in the corner, not taking a lot of resources. It um, you know, can uh, run some applications, right, and so on. So it was not designed as to go in and kind of take all the resources of a box, right, and, uh, and not uh, get anybody else to uh, run. What that means is what you want to tune MySQL server. Right, and uh, here's a, uh, a link to a webinar I did, uh, did uh, on this topic. Uh, it's not rocket science. Typically, you, you get like maybe 10 options you tune in MySQL, and you get it 95% where it needs to be, uh, right, compared to, to defaults. Storage engine, right? When it comes to storage engine, uh, InnoDB is the uh, default storage engine, and uh, it is absolutely fantastic for a lot of workloads. Uh, in some cases, uh, you may uh, check out their TokuDB for high inserts, uh, and if you uh, want to get some uh, 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 much higher level of compressions than InnoDB, you can explore that. Anybody try TokuDB here? Okay, well. I see some hands, and that's good to hear. I have finished sharding. So when do you want to, uh, th when do you want to shard? Well, here's the challenge we have, right? If you shard too early, we are likely to waste our resources because development and operations are going to be more complicated after we shard it, right? But if you uh, shard too late, you can run into a wall. Right, because your application just unable to handle uh, the performance required uh, on that. So in this case, what I like to be thinking about is uh, the term called uh, uh, architecture runway, right? Sharding is one of the architecture considerations you guys have, and think about this uh, this way, and uh, take it uh, as a part of your architecture runway planning with all the other things you guys uh, consider as a part of architecture thing, clean up technical debt, right, uh, uh, other optimizations, and so on and so forth. And what you need to understand in this case is how long it's going to take you to implement the sharding. Depending on your team pace, depending on your application complexity, and so on and so forth, it may vary a lot, right? Like, guys, I can honestly tell you, uh, people have come to us, asked for sharding advice, and tell me, oh, that's fine, we'll go ahead and implement or we can't. I'm saying, are you crazy? You're not going to implement over weekend. But they actually did, right? They would uh, had the application simple enough, small, very agile team, which will go and implement sharding or, or weekend in the application, right? In the other hand, I have seen some other legacy application which was written for, uh, you know, 10 years, ton of queries, complexity. It may take a year or more, really, to implement a sharding, right? And I think that's important you make yourself an honest assessment and balance with your capacity, how much you guys can run your current applications, with how long it would take you to implement uh, implement sharding, right? So that brings us to the capacity planning, right? So for us not to run into a wall, we need to know where that wall is, right? Make sense? 
So uh, we want to uh, figure out how we can uh, do that, uh, right, to understand that we want to do some estimates, maybe uh, do some benchmarks. Be conservative, right, in this case, because it's much better to pre uh, prevent the, to predict the wall 20% lower, right, than 20% further down, right, and when you run into a wall and you're still not uh, ready for your implementation. And one is very important thing is do not ever plan for linear scalability, right? So if you look in, let's say, at your system and saying, oh, well, currently I see only 10% of a CPU used. So that means I can handle 10x of query on this system. That is a very, very bad math, right? Uh, math, right? That's not going to happen for, mm, for many reasons. Now, I have been kind of very uh, critical of sharding, but are there any benefits of that, right? Well, and as if almost everything in this world, there are always like positives and negatives, right? If you look uh, hard enough. So what are the positives for uh, sharding? Well, one is sharding is really your road to the ultimate scalability, right? If you guys are building something uh, Facebook to scale, then you will need to shard uh, sooner or later. And uh, sharding may allow you to, uh, to reduce some other complexities, right, or eliminate them. So, for example, I have seen people saying, hey, you know what, uh, yes, we do some caching, but we want to avoid having that extensively complicated caching level, right, with all those kind of uh, uh, invalidating cache properly, right? Our developers don't like that. It's complicated. Well, we just better bite the bullet, bullet once. We shard it. We'll have most of our data in MySQL memory. And accessing data in MySQL memory is pretty fast as well, right? You guys have uh, seen the numbers of more than half a million a second. Uh, asynchronous replication. That's another one, right? I've seen a number of customers saying, oh my gosh, our developers, they absolutely hate dealing with asynchronous replication. Because it has this property of it works most of the time, right? I can go, in most cases, on my slave and get the data which will be re reasonably accurate. But sometimes I get just some silly stale data. Developers don't like it a lot because there is no built-in guarantees in the replication about the data stale, uh, staleness. Uh, which it uh, will be to provide. So in many cases, we see people just sharding when they say, hey, we read from, a slave, from masters, we write to, this, to the masters. Our slaves are used uh, for availability purposes and for some other applications, for example, some reporting. Because reporting, I know, reading a little bit stale data, not a big deal. Sharding also helps us to, do, to have better security and uh, compliance as well as possibly having the data closer to users. So for example, a lot of software as a service applications often would shard things uh, to really separate the data between uh, different customers, you know, completely. Different customers live in a different MySQL instances, so uh, even if developers do some mistakes, it's very hard for this data to, uh, 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 to intermix, right? And frankly, some of the uh, customers may even require this kind of uh, isolation as a part of that contract, so that is a benefit. Right. Now, you guys uh, also may hear some of uh, this uh, sharing on the global scale, right? Some of you may have heard about those recent law changes, uh, and as well as like political changes in the countries, where some countries may require you to keep the data for their users in that country. It's much easier to move to that kind of environment if you're sharded already, right? Makes sense? So often that will be kind of not purely technical consideration, but uh, something beyond that. Now, costs may also be an important factor here. Right? Now, uh, if you uh, take a look at the majority, like managed hosting providers and the cloud providers, they uh, really kind of uh, want to take advantage of your pain, right? So uh, what I mean by that is you would find what the margin, right, or how the cost escalates for very, very high powerful system is, uh, uh, is phenomenal, right? You can see high-end system being uh, charged, you know, 10x as a low-end system, even if you go to, I don't know, let's say, uh, the store to buy one, right, the difference in price will be only like 2x or so, right? So 
uh, what that means in practice is what you often uh, find if you cloud providers or, uh, I mean, even if it's the systems you buy, uh, the systems which have an optimal price performance ratio. Right? To, to give an example, you can get four socket systems with uh, Intel CPUs, right? but those will be very, very uh, expensive those days. Right? They're much more expensive than two, two socket systems, even though they don't even give you like, typically 2x of, uh, uh, of performance. Right? So if we don't have to go for that the most expensive hardware, we can have a much more uh, optimal system, and sharding allows us to pretty much pick the systems of any, uh, any size. Because if you have implemented sharding well, you can shard over 10 systems or 20 systems, right? And that really should not matter. And as I mentioned, that's especially important in the cloud because uh, cloud may have a, uh, a relatively lower instance uh, size what you can get compared to a physical hardware uh, you can buy, right? In terms of uh, the top performance, which is uh, accessible in the cloud. So when uh, do we shard, right, as a summary? Well, first is sharding can be a good idea when it's easy in your case. Some applications are easier to shard than others in uh, both in development and operations. Second is when scaling up is an exposable, uh, impossible to expensive. I mentioned cloud, but enterprise can also have a silly politics, right? I remember the guys who had to shard because there was a MySQL DB8 team and an ops team, and the ops team believed what 16 gigabyte ought to be enough for everybody, right? And they would not provide them virtual instance with more than 16 gigs of, uh, of memory, right? So they had to, uh, they had to shard. Well, uh, now you also uh, may want to do that. Then uh, your application is so, uh, growing so fast, so sharding is imminent anyway, right? And in this case, you may want to invest your sort of sharding, which will give you, you know, huge performance gains compared to, to some small optimizations trying to pick up 5% here and 10% and there. So what are a few uh, sharding questions we can talk about? Well, sharding level, key unit, how we handle availability and sharding technology. Let's look at those in more details, and that will make sense. What is a sharding level? Well, uh, there is uh, two ways to think about that. One is you shard only on the MySQL level. Another, you kind of think uh, at your uh, sharding by deployment unit to a full stack level, right? So you can say, hey, I take my MySQL and uh, you know, web service and the cache, right? And I shard uh, all of that, uh, of that completely, right? Now, you often do the second one, for example, if you want to place those things in different regions, right, or, uh, uh, or, or something like that, or to get either better security isolation uh, and isolation at all, right, because if you have uh, essentially some very thin load balancer which kind of splits your, your customers to different pods, right, or whatever you want to call those nodes, then they're completely independent, right? And the failure effective, uh, affecting one of, uh, one of it is probably not going to impact everybody else, right? And you may have just, I don't know, 5% of unhappy customers, which is much easier to deal with from all kind of things, right? Including providing them a good customer service. Sharding keys. When you pick a keys on the database for sharding, we, we consider a couple of things. One is what uh, one most accesses Right? Simple accesses should go to a single shard. Right? If, you, uh, if most of your accesses hit all the shards, that is, that is bad design. Right? Now, no shard is large in terms of uh, mm, uh, data size or load it generates. Right? So for example, sharding by country may be a good idea in the, in the first, of, uh, first one, right? because most accesses for many applications will go to a single country. But then there are way too large countries, right, for most applications. And they are very disbalanced, right? I mean, you have a country like China or US with a ton of population. They have somebody like, uh, I don't know, let's say Czech Republic, right, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, much, much smaller. Uh, another thing to consider is when you shard, you don't have to pick one, right? In, in certain cases, for certain data access points, you may uh, want to shard, uh, shard uh, pick a couple of uh, 
sharding keys and double store uh, the data one way or, or another, right? So to give you example, systems like Flixster, for example, right, which is social network around movies, so it had a two very different, but the most important data, uh, data access pattern. Even through a movie, when you have all the comments and all the vibe about the movie, or about you as a user, so what you have said, and so on and so forth, right? So in such case, it would make sense to uh, double store some of the data, which is very fast to access from one dimension or another. Because, uh, well, uh, storage is, mm, is cheap. Sharding unit. What do we do here? Do we shard by physical MySQL instance schema, or do we kind of sh uh, shard it on a very logical level where you can have multiple shard objects uh, placed in the same set of schemas and database? Well, it depends, right? Typically, if you are dealing with something like software as a service where you have, I don't know, let's say small number of customers which pay you lots of money, right? Maybe 1,000, 10,000, uh, 100,000, you can. Uh, uh, actually even set up a small physical MySQL instances, especially those days if containers, right, you can, uh, uh, you know, run pretty large amount of them uh, effectively. Uh, but if you have ton of users, something like a Facebook, then typically you end up uh, uh, having multiple kind of short keys short, uh, uh, short in the same set of uh, tables or schemas. Another thing to consider, what uh, is high-ability, right? Because the more servers you have, the more there is chance for one of them uh, would fail, right? So pretty much if you uh, have rolled out the large uh, sharding, you most likely will need to implement some of the for some high ability scenario uh, as well, right? And it even becomes more important than just single server, because uh, if you just have a one single physical server, I've seen instances when people would uh, have no downtime in many years, right? And they just rely on backups and it works for them. I mean, if you think about somebody like uh, Facebook, right? They have many, or Google, they have many, many failures uh, every day. Right, every hour even probably. So, uh, if technology d doesn't uh, compensate for that, that will be a disaster. So, uh, pretty much two co two common approaches to that. You can shard even o over master slave clusters, right, with the often referred, or use PXC or some other uh, Galera related uh, technology. Let's look at um, some sharding approaches which exist those days. Uh, roll your own, which is probably the most popular one, especially on the uh, large, uh, large scale, right? I mean, all those big guys typically have something very tied in with all everything what they are doing. Uh, and in, in the MySQL world, it's uh, heavily custom. Uh, Vitesse. Uh, Vitesse uh, uh, is actually, in my opinion, the open source technology is to, to watch because I think it has been proven in production uh, in, uh, in uh, YouTube, but those guys are very, very serious about making that into a good open source project and uh, putting a lot of very good documentation and so on and so forth, right? So uh, I'm very excited to see what uh, that would be. There are some other uh, technologies like uh, Jetpants and Shard Query, which kind of exist out there in an open source, but they don't have nearly as supported momentum uh, out there. Uh, other things. Uh, Clustrix. This is a proprietary technology which has a built-in, uh, MySQL Comportable has built-in sharding, right? Uh, from technological standpoint, it's actually quite interesting, but uh, because it's kind of Closed source of a small community, I didn't have a, a seat having enough to, a lot of traction. MySQL cluster, that is another interesting technology which does a certain level of sharding automatically for you. Anybody runs MySQL cluster here? Okay. Anybody tried running MySQL cluster here? Okay. You, you guys know it, right? People who tried <laughs> running MySQL cluster, there are much more of those when you're still, uh, still running it, right? Uh, this is rather complicated technologies, uh, right, with a lot of kind of tricks. It's absolutely fantastic for certain workloads, 
right? But uh, it's not uh, as great for uh, many other things. Um, it's relatively complicated. And what I will also mention is uh, there's actually had been a lot of uh, interesting work done with MySQL cluster over the last couple of years or last three years. So if you gave it, uh, gave it a look like five years ago, uh, you may want to check it out again, uh, right? But I would say also when you speak about MySQL cluster, it's kind of something which gives you like a medium level of sharding, right? Maybe if you need to shard and get, let's say, 10 nodes if all the data fits in memory, that may be the application for MySQL cluster. If you're doing the math and saying, oh, I will have a thousand nodes in production, right, in a year or two, that is not nearly uh, what MySQL cluster can support, right? And in this case, it's, uh, it's not going to be good enough. A few others. MySQL Fabric. That is a, a sharding effort in, uh, by Oracle, which I think is uh, interesting. Uh, and I don't know what I mean by interesting in this case. Uh, uh, I mean, I am uh, really would be interested uh, to see it uh, in more in production. So far, there is a lot of a developer to uh, talk from Oracle about that, but I haven't seen it really deployed uh, at a large scale. Uh, a Tizor database virtualization engine that was also pretty nice uh, open source project, but as they kind of moved uh, out as a, uh, as a company and focus on different things, I don't think it's, uh, it's being well maintained anymore. Scale Arc has some rule-based sharding engine, which is uh, also commercial, but I actually see a lot of uh, Scale Arc uh, uh, deployed, right? So that is a pretty Pretty common solution out there, especially by uh, enterprise uh, customers who don't, uh, don't mind using this kind of proprietary software. There was alternative to scale arc here, scale base, right, which uh, I keep here uh, as a zombie uh, on the slide as a reminder what uh, a lot of uh, proprietary technology companies may die and uh, kind of the technology we had will, can just disappear and stop being available. So, a few things in summary, right? You guys can see what there are multiple technologies available for sharding. In the space of MySQL, unlike some others, there is no just standard way to shard, right? There is no some sharding solutions which 99% of the people are, uh, are using out there, right? And you just can't follow. So, uh, you can see it as a downside or you can see it as an opportunity to become creative. Uh, that's up to you. So if you guys are looking for uh, sharding, what we uh, as a Percona can, uh, can do? Well, there is a, a, a lot we can do, right? We uh, have both helped a number of companies to implement a sharding as well as supported them uh, with uh, shared environments, you through support or managed services. And uh, if you guys are very much uh, interested to learn more about MySQL, is a MySQL is a kind of big part of your life, uh, consider coming to uh, Percona Live in Santa Clara in April. We'll have uh, uh, you know huge amount of MySQL content, and this year we'll also have content about the, uh, about a lot of other open source uh, operational uh, and analytical databases, right? MongoDB, uh, you know Cassandra, and uh, and others. Well, uh, that's it for me, and uh, I will be happy to answer your questions. Uh, I guess I haven't seen EXC before, but when I looked it up, all the links point to Pacific Extreme Combat Mixed Martial Arts Club. <laughs> oh, okay, well. Uh, Yes, well, uh, uh, oh yes, well, uh, I, I mentioned that I, but I didn't clarify the abbreviation. So when I mentioned PXC, that is Percona XRGB Cluster. Yes, yes, no, but that, uh, but that's a, uh, that, that is a good catch, right? So is that actually what happened? You entered PXC and there is no PXC out there? Uh, okay, can you send me a screenshot that I'll share it with our marketing, right, and tell me, you know, how come, yeah? You can't even get us to a front page? <laughs> okay, any other questions? And if you want to troll me, that's fine, right? I mean. <laughs>
<laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, yeah, two, two things. Uh, first, uh, let me put another, uh, another plug, right? Actually, what I would be, one of the talks I'm very interested in at Fircon Alive, where F Facebook is going to talk about how they're doing back stuff at scale, right? And I think it's, for me, it would be very interesting to see what exactly strategies they, uh, they deploy, right? Now, backups, you, ne you need for, shard uh, for sharding, right? And what I see a lot is uh, people have some sort of a fuzzy backups, right? So, for example, say, hey, we take the shards and backups plus the backup binary, uh, binary logs, right? So, if you ever have to need to restore the shard to a given point in time, approximately, they can do, uh, do it, right? Having something like on a large sharding system, uh, doing the kind of a global uh, checkpoint, that is possible, but typically is quite uh, uh, is a bit painful, right? I mean, you can. Uh, I've seen people doing that uh, by, for example, uh, you know, like pausing replication on all the slaves, right? So not to impact the master, then making some sort of um, well note on the binary log position which corresponds to them, and taking the consistent backup right for everything if, if, if consistency is needed. Now, another thing about the uh, shards is. Uh, consistency between the different shards, right, is typically a little bit loose. It's not like you have a foreign keys, right, and it's kind of absolutely going to be out there. So, because of various failure scenarios, if there is a certain data consistency which has to be maintained between the shards, then it is good to have certain scripts to, to check it and fix it. Because data drift will happen, Right, and uh, you better have some tools to fix it. And that is what people can do, right? They can, as well, in a worst case scenario, if something happens, I, re I restore backup. Maybe it's not kind of exactly consistent with some other shard, right? But uh, I can, uh, well, I know there is my source of truth, right, for the data. Let's say this user lives on this shard, and then I go and uh, ch check the things to ensure the relationships with other shards are consistent. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, I think it's a, you always have to be looking at what exactly problem you're solving. So because uh, you can you can really get like hundred percent consistent backups right across uh, across, but that's going to cost you right. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of cases people just not don't pay in uh, those costs because again, among other things, um, well, like here's the thing, right? Uh, I think and uh, backups in general, if you think about backups in uh, in scenario where there is a redundancy and there is no redundancy, there are two different things, right? Because if I, let's say, let's say have my laptop, right? And I just lo lose my hard drive or, or, or something uh, uh, like this, right? Then in a lot of cases, I will have a full restore, right? And that is going to my use case. Now think about if there is a master, Mm, uh, and the slave, which is constantly replicated. If I lose hard drive on this laptop, I will just fail over, right, to the slave. I don't do backup restore in this case. When does backup restore happen? Well, if you have some developer with dirty fingers, right? Anybody seen those? Right, uh, which uh, kind of like, uh, uh, you know, ruins some database. What happens in this case, though, is typically they trash one of the tables. Well, some developers are very gifted and will trash all your tables, right? <laughs> uh, uh, but, but typically, it's going to one of a few, right? So you have to restore the tables which were trashed, or even the data which was trashed, right? Which is a very different backup scenario, uh, a restore scenario, right, than you may be thinking about, uh, right? So uh, that is why we, when you have a replication, often you have to optimize for how you can restore pieces of the data, right? And maybe kind of do partial binary log uh, recovery right, to catch up those pieces of data you, you, you restore, right? And, and fun stuff like that. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Have you uh, had any experiences where uh, some of your customers came to you and wanted to get rid of sharding and they were interested in that? And if so, how did that go? Well, uh, I think, uh, yes. In some cases, we would see that uh, as a consolidation, right, uh, 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 possible. 
I think uh, things have uh, actually become a little bit better in this regard more recently with MariaDB and now with MySQL 5.7 offer multi-source replication, which allows you to find in replication. If you want to get all the stuff together, you may be able to do that. Uh, we also did some work with uh, a tungsten uh, a, a replicator uh, uh, to do that. But well, uh, it is possible, but that's uh, also, I would say, not uh, not totally easy because in a lot of cases people would have created the ideas which uh, are conflicting and so on and so forth, right? So that's going to uh, depend a lot on the application what exactly you're going to do. Well, yes, yeah, I think that is a, and I think in a lot of cases it's also a process of a during the sharding, right? Is how do you, uh, because when you speak undo the sharding, is that a consequence of a failed sharding project? What they implemented with sharding, and now that application version which supports sharding just blow up, right? And we want to go back. Or it was in production for five years and then they say, hey, you know what? Application is not growing and you know, now hardware is so powerful we don't need sharding anymore, right? Those are two very different cases, cases because in the first case, we'll have to kind of temporarily maintain some scaffolding so we can always go back to uncharted system, right? Okay, any other questions? Well, I think it's, uh, uh, you know, I can tell, I think it's, uh, it depends a lot on the scale, right? Line node is, I see, very well used on this, uh, on the kind of small, uh, smaller scale. If you look for large scale re resources, the AWS is probably uh, the most popular one uh, uh, we see. Um, we see some more of uh, uh, Rackspace, right? Uh, people who has been using Rackspace managed service starting to use Rackspace Cloud a lot, right? They like the support approach and, uh, Avi goodies, so uh, it has been uh, varying, right? Uh, Google Cloud SQL also uh, looks interesting, but I think, you know, when it comes to us, people really choose cloud for their databases, right? They choose cloud for their applications, and they, their database are going to live in that cloud, and that's what we have to deal with. Okay, anything else? Yes, go ahead. Uh, talk a little bit more about what? Balance in the uh, balance in the demand spikes. Oh, okay, okay. So when I um, balance in the, uh, the spikes, yes. So when I spoke about the spikes, right, is uh, um, I was talking about the queuing, right? And here is an interesting thing, right? Is if you think about uh, a read workload, reads and writes, right? Which of those are really hard to deal with? A lot of people uh, speak about writes, right? Writes are hard. It's kind of, you have to actually modify the data. But actually, reads are much more hard in many cases because when you are doing reads, you have to get the user data right now, right? Until you have given that user the data, I mean, he doesn't get his value, right? When you're speaking about the writes, in a lot of cases, we can just put them in some sort of, uh, of, of queue and apply later. And frankly, MySQL is already doing some of that for you, right? Think about what happens when you update the data in InnoDB table. It goes essentially in the queue like a log, right? And then it's going to be flushed from a buffer pool to the disk sometime later, right? If your log files are large, it's maybe much, much later, right? And, and that is... Uh, uh, essentially, the, uh, the, the idea for writes, so if you have some writes which are very expensive and you can afford certain delays, right? you put them in the queue and have some background worker to apply that at the given pace instead of slowing your, uh, uh, all your users. Right? So, so that, I think, is, uh, uh, is the main thing. Now, if you look at the other load management technique, which, uh, which I would mention, is uh, well, not all the features are created equals from a user value standpoint, right? So make sure you can disable them in the load spikes, right? If you, you, if you can't bring up in more capacity, right? Or if you don't have any other tools and toolbox. I remember for years, for example, you guys could see uh, Wikipedia search sometimes being down, right? We're saying, hey guys, you know what? We are, uh, Wikipedia, you didn't donate us enough money, so we don't have enough servers. So search is not working, right? Come back later. But 
if you just use Google as a search, right, it still would be working and performing very, very fast, right? And I think that is very important to prioritize what a user experience, right? And not trying to make it kind of bad performance or a bad experience for all your users for all features, but better to have, you know, certain users to have a downtime, right, and certain features not work, and others to be like absolutely fantastic. Does that make sense? In terms of load management. And what that means, by the way, right, is what you want to design the features so you can disable them easily, right, in production. So then the feature becomes broken, right, or it creates too much unanticipated load, you can maybe disable that. And what's that? Well, yes, uh, yeah, I think you're speaking about another interesting thing, right? When the, uh, this is kind of a good development practice, right? If you're, de if you're developing the large features on the scale, often gradual rollout is great, right? So you roll out feature for 5%, then you say, oh, it, it works, you know, gradually you roll out it for more, right? Well, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it can be, uh, can be back and forth, right? It doesn't have to be black and white. Yes. Well, I think uh, that is a very good, uh, good question, right? because if you think about that, MySQL is not really great analytical database, right, in this case. I mean, it's uh, uh, because if you, those, those days you have a lot of data, and if you want to analyze data, we want to have features, typically, right, being able to crunch a lot of data in a parallel, right, and use all the uh, multi-core. So what we have uh, uh, in this case is mm, some sort of an ETL uh, process, right, and uh, I mean, there is a lot of integration those days, right, you can use Scoop with MySQL to get a data in Hadoop, there is uh, bin uh, multiple tools right now, how you can get from binary logs to Hadoop, you can use tungsten replication, there is, I know some work how Kafka is being integrated right with uh, MySQL, so you get some data out and then put into into whatever system you would like to uh, do, right? So, uh, lots of choices those days. Yeah, and uh, I would also mention what some people, right, uh, we see, who really love MySQL and they love pain, they can use multi-source replication to try to get it to one Frankenstein box, right, and uh, try to query, write, run queries out there. Yes? Well, uh, Opteron um, is dead, right? If you ha haven't noticed, right? Uh, unfortunately, with CPUs, we pretty much don't have a choice those days, right? I mean, in server-grade CPUs, Intel owns the market, right? We may uh, have something to come out of your power, uh, or, or like ARM is kind of picking up ahead on the server, or uh, there is Risk Five, right? But it, it's all probably like five years ahead. For now, you typically would look at the uh, at the Xeons, right? Uh, uh, and the choices you have is uh, pretty much going to be uh, defined by how many sockets you have, right, and how much memory you support. Because low-end Xeons would only support like 32 or 64 gigs of RAM, gigs of RAM right? Uh, not enough, uh, right? And then uh, uh, that, that is pretty much uh, is main main direction uh, what you're looking for. Uh, as I mentioned with MySQL, for most workloads, uh, you want for, uh, faster cores, not necessarily so many of them, mm, right? Uh, but that again varies, right? In some cases you uh, may want a little bit more cores if your uh, workload has an Afghan currency. So that's uh, what uh, I would mention. Any any other particles you're looking for? Well, I, I would also mean uh, a lot of a lot of memory, right? I mentioned for that. Uh, if your workload fits in memory, it's fant that's fantastic. And for solid state drives, uh, SATA and SAS are bad, right? Because uh, that kind of bandwidth that SAS, uh, SAS and uh, SATA interface provide is just way too narrow. So you want to uh, uh, get some NVMe. NVMe or like or other PCI Express based storage if you're looking for best performance. 
yeah, NVMe, right, or uh, our PCI Express things, right? For example, Fusion I.O. is not quite NVMe because NVMe is kind of standard, but it's also very fast because it goes through PCI Express bus, not for some, uh, you know, funky interface which was designed for spinning disks. What's that? Well, for Flash, it's, uh, if you have a chance, avoid SAS and uh, SATA drives, right? We're going to limit your bandwidth compared to PCI Express. Well, uh, I, I think this is kind of a little bit uh, apples and oranges, right, if you look at uh, in this case. So if you speak about the uh, Galera, that is a, a, replica uh, that is a replication technology, right? Wherever you, uh, so uh, at the, in this case, right? And uh, uh, Ga Galera doesn't necessarily help uh, it helps you in terms of that you have a little bit more predictable um, uh, latency and replication, right? But uh, s still, you can scale your write 10x, right, with, with the Galera. Wherever it's you using one or another, you need to think about that, right? Uh, also, thing is, uh, actually, I would say, um, because of how uh, Galera works, right, often uh, uh, the limit of a data size per instance you would keep with Galera is smaller than for con conventional MySQL, right? Uh, I mean, I wouldn't go into, let's say, 10 terabytes Galera cluster because if you ever need to do SST, uh, that's going to be very painful. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, guys, and uh, I will uh, hang out today and uh, tomorrow at a Pircona booth at uh, Expo Hall. You know, if you uh, want to stop by, please do. Uh, we should also have some toys out there, right, uh, if you like to. Thank you.